welcome. You're listening to Ask the Doulas, a podcast where we talk to experts from all over the country about topics related to pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and early parenting. Let's chat. Hello, hello. This is Kristen, and I am joined again by Amber Shaw. Now, Amber filled us in a bit on her VBAC story, and today we're going to talk about her postnatal journey. Welcome, Amber. Thank you so much. So fill us in. We've talked a bit about your birth story with Miles, but now we're going to talk about, you know, immediately coming home from um, delivering and just how you felt in recovery and feeding and all of the things. Well, I guess my story kind of start, you know, right, right after my delivery. So going into it, I didn't know really what to expect with a vaginal delivery and, you know, the healing process because my first was a C-section. So I knew what that was like, and, you know, I prepared and I, you know, bought the pad sickles and like, you know, bought the stuff, (laughs) you know, to kind of heal myself. But looking back on it, I think that so much preparation goes into birth. You know, you spend months and months, you know, mentally and physically preparing for birth. And it, you know, it's kind of like a, it happens in the blink of an eye almost. And then you're kind of left with your postpartum journey, which I don't think is prepared for nearly enough. Totally agree. Yeah. That was kind of my realization. I, you know, went into it thinking that, you know, a vaginal birth was going to be way easier to heal from. I was going to be able to just kind of, you know, get up and start moving around and start walking and just, you know, it was, I was just going to bounce back quicker. And so, you know, right after delivery, I get up into my room and they want me, you know, to get up and go to the bathroom. And I realized I couldn't walk at all. It was excruciating and it wasn't even necessarily like the stitch area. It was just everything like and the my, cramping you feel after delivery. it was my yeah it was well as my pelvic bone it was my pubic bone I quickly realized because I couldn't take a step forward I had to like side shuffle almost because I had so much destabilization from pushing for so long and it was just shocking to me like the pain was shocking the fact that I couldn't walk was shocking it's like not what I expected yeah. and I feel like I immediately was just like kind of taken off guard by what was going on with my body and so and they were I think the nurses like everybody was just kind of confused as to why I couldn't walk and the whole like pubic symphysis situation I was dealing with still wasn't really like realized at that point even by me, I, I just didn't understand like why I couldn't walk and, you know, come to find out a little bit down the road. Like now we understand like what happened um, and, and why I was so, you know, in so much pain, but every single time I had to get up and go to the bathroom, I had to call the nurses in just this like big thing and just not what I expected at all. So the first night in the hospital was really rough. I was having a hard time just getting pain under control. And, you know, again, with my first birth, you're on narcotics when you have a C-section, because obviously it's like a surgical procedure. But this time, like I felt, you know, like my body went through more and you're given like Tylenol. It was not the same laughable, you know, thinking about it, not that I wanted to be like drugged up, but it's like, oh my gosh, it just didn't even like light a candle to the discomfort I was, you know, dealing with. So I was really like more just leaning on and other things that I could do because obviously, you know, I didn't really have like pain medication to help with like the discomfort. So I was trying to keep a lot of ice on myself, but it was rough. And I do feel like I was let go from the hospital probably sooner than I should have been. I was still just like not mobile at all. And we just weren't prepared for this. You know, we have a four-year-old at home. I have a newborn and I needed full-time care myself. Like I couldn't get up and move at all. Like I had to be helped to the bathroom. You know, I had a walker. I had to use a walker at home. So My mom ended up coming. Thank God she met us here the night I got home from the hospital and she stayed with us for like three weeks. That was such a blessing. And, you know, I look back on it and I I don't know what I would have done if she wouldn't have been able to come at the drop of the dime like that. It's not what we were planning on, you know? Right. I thought I was going to be up and moving and, you know, Ashton was off of work and he was going to be able to help out with the boys too, but that just like was not our situation at all. And so that was really helpful. So she met us, you know, at her house that night. 
And man, the first couple nights were just so rough. I couldn't find a comfortable spot to be in at all. Like laying down was painful. Sitting up fully was painful. I think I slept the first night at home, like in a recliner with like the bassinet next to me, just having a hard time finding any comfort at all at first. And then a couple days later when I was just not as raw, but obviously still, you know, dealing with some discomforts. I had Annie from Rise come out and do some adjustments, you know, for Miles and I, and I just cried and cried to her. I Uh. was just, just broken. I didn't understand, you know, why I couldn't even like walk at that point. And I just was devastated at the state of my body. And also kind of at this point, um, a friend of mine, had come over the night after I had gotten home because I just like had some concerns about how I was feeling. I felt like my blood pressure was really low. I was just feeling so completely depleted and I just didn't know if it was normal or not. And so she came over and she noticed that I had a little bit of an arrhythmia going on with my heart. And she's like, has anybody ever noticed that before? You know, nobody, it hasn't really been brought up before. So I was like, no, not really you know, might just be like a postpartum thing. So I brought it up to Annie. She kind of noticed it as well. Then it was kind of just kind of forgotten about, you know, she adjusted me and my heart was feeling weird, but there's so much other stuff going on, you know, with my body. I kind of ignored that for the time being. So, you know, two weeks after Miles was born, I came down with my first round of mastitis (laughs) and miserable. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was you know, I'd read about it and I was always really scared to get it with Parker. So I was really diligent about, you know, pumping and massaging and just like always emptying myself. And I feel like because, you know, this healing process was so different, I wasn't managing my breastfeeding as well. Like I kind of let him feed on one side and then, you know, right. he's kind of a grazer. <laughs> he doesn't yeah. like empty me on both sides. He kind of grazes. And so I was just kind of letting him do that. And yeah, the mastitis, you know, came on quick and I didn't even really realize what it was. I thought I had like a UTI or something. And the very next day was, you know, we had an appointment with miles and my midwife checked me out in the bathroom. Um, I didn't really have an appointment with her, but she's like, I want to look at you. And she kind of realized that I had mastitis because I was pretty engorged at that point, but I still was like, I don't know if I do, but absolutely did. It hit really hard and fast. That was really rough and always just a little discouraging to get that, you know, right off the bat because you just want to like start out your breastfeeding journey so strong. And it was discouraging to have that going on while I was dealing with so many, you know, other issues. And I was so scared about my supply. Of course. And being on antibiotics, you know, right after you have a baby, I I didn't want to do that. But, you know, ultimately, you know, your care has to kind of come first because if you're not doing well, obviously you can't care for your baby as well either. So that was another, another little hurdle that was pretty tough, but it's weird. It like comes on quick, but then also goes away relatively quickly. So, you know, after a day or two of antibiotics, I started feeling better and my supply kind of got back up and kind of got over that hurdle a little bit. So, you know, I was still dealing with not being able to walk very well, but it was getting a little bit better at this point. And I had my six week checkup and I was still dealing with quite a bit of discomfort in my stitch area and particularly one side of my stitches. So I felt like one side was healing better than the other. And I didn't know if that was normal. I feel like you never know what's normal because (laughs) this experience was new to you. It was different. Yeah. 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 And I feel like everything's normal and everything's not normal at the same time. You're just like, you know, this is my journey, you know, maybe this is normal to experience, but at the same time, you're kind of questioning everything at the same time. You kind of feel like you're kind of floating along with just not a lot of like direction and on the healing process and what that should look like. And so I had my six week appointment and I was checked that I was brought up my concern. And I, you know, said that I was still having quite a bit of pain on one side. And during my exam, it was realized that I needed a revision on my stitches. So that (sighs) was quite a blow. I had already had six weeks of healing under my belt and then had to, you know, have them redone on one side, on that side that I had quite a bit of pain in. And it was explained to me, you know, obviously when you push for a while, you're very swollen. And I was stitched up when I was pretty swollen. And, you know, they try to kind of 
piece the tissue back together as much as possible, but sometimes things can happen. And so I had some like nerve and rawness exposure that needed to be fixed. And that was really scary because I was still so just, I was just wrecked down there. And to think about going through that while I was still like in the process of healing was just terrifying. And it really, that was like a tough thing to to wrap my head around. And so, you know, it happened pretty quickly. The very next week I ended up getting in and got the revision done. And that really set me back quite a bit. I expected it to be obviously like painful and uncomfortable, but it really kind of, it was extremely uncomfortable. And I really had a hard time with the pain during the revision healing process, like almost worse than the first time around. And I'm not really sure why that is, but yeah, thank God my mom ended up coming back yet again. Yeah. She was at our house kind of helping with everything while I, you know, took it easy and just iced. And, you know, it took quite a while for that to get back, to get back to kind of a normal, to feel like I was actually like healing. I feel like it's such a blur still in my mind, like all of it. So it's kind of hard to like sort. Of course. Yeah. Hey, Alyssa here. I'm just popping in to tell you about our course called Becoming. Becoming a mother is your guide to a confident pregnancy and birth, all in a convenient six-week online program. From birth plans to sleep training and everything in between, you'll gain the confidence and skills you need for a smooth transition to motherhood. You'll get live coaching calls with Kristen and myself, a bunch of expert videos, including chiropractic care, pelvic floor physical therapy, mental health experts, breastfeeding, and much more. You'll also get a private Facebook community with other mothers going through this at the same time as you to offer support and encouragement when you need it most. And then of course, you'll also have direct email access to me and Kristen in addition to the live coaching calls. If you'd like to learn more about the course, you can email us at info at goldcoastdoulas.com or check it out at thebecomingcourse.com. We'd love to see you there. So healing from the revision was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. You know, I was thinking, you know, I just had to get it revised on, you know, one side, but it really set me back quite a bit in just my healing process. I felt like I was kind of at the beginning all over again. I used a ton and just having to like rest a lot. And I am just a busy body. I'm not good at resting. And at this point, I'm like seven weeks into my healing journey and I'm feeling like I'm on week one again. And it was just a really discouraging time. And right, I, because you think you'll get start, cleared for exercise yes. and all of these things by that point. And yeah, like six weeks is what you kind of like have a goal of just having some kind of normalcy back. And I was not even close to that. I wasn't even close to normalcy. <sighs> and it was, I, I just felt like I had so many people reaching out and being like, how are you? How are you? And I was so sick of even talking about all of these like hurdles I was facing. So I wasn't even really being honest with people because it was just exhausting. Like for me to tell them that I had yet another thing done and, you know, even talking about a revision, it's kind of just not something you want to like talk to people about. Cause it's just one of those things about like pregnancy and healing that you're kind of just like mom about a little bit. Yeah, And so sense. I just felt like I was kind of alone, you know, kind of just dealing with this like postpartum thing on my own. And I was clearly on my own timeline. Did you reach out to your doulas? I know you and I talked, but yeah. Yeah. Yep. I was definitely in touch with them. I mean, I had my little tribe, of course, of people that I, you know, felt comfortable with and would like talk about, you know, things with, but, you know, as a whole, I kind of started to kind of get reclusive with people and just, I just didn't even have energy to talk about it anymore. Cause I felt like every time I would kind of, you know, jump ahead in my journey a little bit, I had something that knocked me back. And so this was kind of a little bit of a dark time, you know, during the revision process. Also, like not to mention this is during the summer and I was really looking forward to being able to get in the water with my son again. I did not swim at all this summer. And that seems like Uh, something so little, but, you know, we were out at our cabin a lot and I just could never get in and play with him. And he didn't really understand why, like he did, he knew that I was healing, but it was just sad to sit on the sidelines and not be able to play, you know, in the water. Cause that's right. something that's, that I do a lot. <laughs> that's in Michigan. I mean, summer yes. is our time. <laughs> so. Yeah. The summer was just, oh, the summer did, it just didn't count for me, <laughs> you Aww. know? 
it might as well have been like the winner. Like it, I just feel like I wasn't able to really, you know, enjoy a lot of it, but you know, eventually I did heal from the revision had obviously a lot of sensitivity for a long time. I still do, but that kind of started to fizzle off and I started, you know, to heal a little bit from that. And then, well, at my two week checkup for my revision, I, you know, was in there and the nurse took my pulse, my heart rate. Okay. And she like looked really concerned. And then she did it again. And she wasn't even like talking to me. And then she's like, your heart rate is really low. Hold on one second. And then, you know, she went out and got her watch to like do it the old school way. My heart rate was at like 32, which is insanely low. So, you know, normal is like, 60 is the low end of normal. It's like 60 to hundred with women. Right. And I was in the thirties and she's like, this is really concerning. Do you usually have a low heart rate? And I don't, you know, then my OB came in and checked it too. And they were like, we should advise you really to go to the walk-in clinic or the ER right now, but how are you feeling? Um, and I felt okay. But as they were like talking about it, I could feel, you know, my anxiety almost start to rise. Like it was like a placebo thing. And I was like, oh my God, my heart rate does feel really weird right now. They're like, you need to follow up with your primary care physician immediately, you know, about this. And so it was concerning, you know, they didn't know why my heart rate was so low. And so I ended up getting in with my primary care physician a couple of weeks later. And I kind of thought about it and I was like noticing it a little bit more. And then I kind of remembered that this was brought to my attention like weeks earlier, but I had just had so much other stuff I was juggling with healing and my postpartum stuff that I just like wasn't even paying attention to my heart. But now that everything else was kind of starting to feel a little bit more normal, my heart was like center stage now. And it was like, okay, you have to deal with me now. So, you know, I was like, how is this now happening? You know what I mean? Like, I just felt like I had like one thing after another. And I was like, what is going on with my heart now? So, you know, I have a newborn and I have a four-year-old and it's, you know, concerning. And so, you know, I got onto my primary care physician and she put a heart monitor on me. So I wore a heart monitor for a week and, you know, it recorded everything, got that data in. And then, you know, I had a meeting with her essentially like going over like what she found. And she was like, you need to see a cardiologist. You know, you have a lot of irregularities essentially like with your heart going on right now, you have extreme highs and lows. So I was going from like, you know, my heart rate being in the thirties to like in the high hundreds, like back and forth all day long. And (sighs) she was like, this is not a normal thing. You need to get this checked out. And so I ended up getting in to see a cardiologist and this was a very like stressful time, like thinking that I'm on like the verge of having a heart attack. And I felt like, because I was more aware of it, I was causing probably more of it. You know, I was having a lot of like palpitations at this point. And it was just a really like stressful thing, obviously for my family, my husband's really concerned about me and it's my heart. And so it took a while to get in to see a cardiologist because of course, anytime you need a specialist, you know, it's COVID. So of course, like it took a bit. So probably like three or four weeks, I had to wait to get in to see a cardiologist, but, and I'm still kind of on this journey right now, but long story short, I've essentially been diagnosed with benign PVCs. What that means is I have my heart, like misses a beat and then does like a double beat like all day long and he thinks it is due to trauma from birth and my healing process and also like anxiety which is kind of (laughs) crazy that you know birth and just all of the stress of that can like affect one of your organs like that. I am going to get a second opinion coming up in a few weeks here because I'm still very much experiencing it and it was left a little open-ended. I don't know when or if there's going to be an end to it. It might be something that, you know, I always deal with. So it's kind of just this thing that's still happening. Like I feel it happening. Like right now I have palpitations and it's kind of like becoming a new norm for me, but I'm also like, can this be alleviated somehow? So yeah, yeah, still very much dealing with that. But I, looking back on my postpartum journey, it was not as I expected. And I felt very caught off guard by just how my body, I guess, reacted to birth. Like it was, I felt like I was at like the strongest moment in my life immediately followed by the weakest. 
moment of my life. Um, like not being able to walk directly after. And that was such a hard thing to grapple with because, I'm you know, sure. I was so proud of like what I had just done. And then I felt like my body just fell apart and I kind of abandoned it. I was like, I don't know you anymore and I'm not going to take care of you. Like I should, I felt like I just wasn't in touch with myself as much anymore because I just felt like it failed me. And so I'm very much on a journey right now of trying to love myself, like where I'm at, love my body, where it's at, be in gratitude of it for what it's done and what it's still doing instead of cursing it for not working like it should and jumping back as quickly as I wanted it to. It's been a huge learning process for me that I'm very much still in and it's going to be a long journey for me, I think. And I just feel like I wanted to talk about this because I think women and obviously society, there is a pushback going on right now, thank God, of just the bounce back that you should experience and that you think is like normal after birth. And every single birth is different and every single person's body is different. And you have no idea like- Exactly. And every baby's different. So temperaments and sleep and feeding, it's all unique. So yeah. So to expect to fit into some kind of box, to think that you need to like get back to normal, even at six weeks, I think is insane. Six weeks is nothing compared to like the trauma that your body just went through. So for that to be like this goal of women to be like, I can have sex and I can work out and I can do all these things at six weeks, like get that into my jeans and like all of the goals that we have, which are unrealistic. And you look at traditional cultures um, and, you know, the time that they take for healing and community caring for them. I mean, it's the first 40 days in many cultures, some even longer than that. Um, So and where it they're not lifting a <laughs> finger. And yeah. And so it's just, I feel like we need to get back to really caring for each other. And, you know, the role of a postpartum yes. doula and a lot of that nurturing and healing phase and getting systems in place is so key. Absolutely. I was so grateful to have my mom. And if I didn't have my mom, I absolutely would have had a postpartum doula because when you have another child, especially like, your husband can only take care of so many people. Your <laughs> you partner needs patient. sleep. So <laughs> yeah. Yep. You are the patient and you need to, you know, view yourself as a patient. And, you know, obviously the baby needs care and your other child needs care, but you need it just as much. And I definitely went through a lot of phases where I was just like not taking care of myself. Like I should have. And I felt like my body kept just reminding me, like, you need to slow down. Like I'm going to give you another hurdle here to slow you down, to slow you down. So. And as you said, you're someone who's always on the go. I can relate to that. And yeah, I don't like to slow down for anything. So yeah, but it is um, key to be able to have your mother there to mother you. And that's what postpartum doulas, you know, we always tell our clients, the birthing person is our primary client, then the baby, yes. then yes. the partner and the other children. So yep. it's like, yeah, I feel like you're such an afterthought after birth, you know, like you're just expected to heal in this linear line. Unfortunately, I feel like women, if they're in, you know, a, a traditional like setting, it's very like cut and dry. You know, you give birth, you go through this process, they see you at six weeks, you're cleared at six weeks, and then that's it. And it's like, there's so much gray area floating around in that of just so much gray area that you need to have somebody like a doula or just support people in general to just let you know that you're okay and you're on a road to recovery and what you're experiencing is normal. Yeah. And before we end talking about like building your team of support, what, what point I know that you are seeing a pelvic floor therapist for healing. At what mm -hmm. point were you able to get help after healing? It took me a long time, mainly because of my tissue damage. So I wanted to see a pelvic floor therapist immediately. Like I wanted to see them at six weeks, but at six weeks I had to be restitched. So to have anybody down there doing anything was just cringe worthy for me. Of course. So I feel like I got a later start to therapy than I wanted to have, but it was also just like, It was my timeline. And so I just started seeing a pelvic floor therapist about six weeks ago. I'm dealing with some prolapse as well. So I wasn't sure that's what it was. You know, I was experiencing just sensations down there that I knew wasn't normal, but 
once again, like when it's your first vaginal birth and you're healing from that, like you don't know what normal is. And so I nothing to compare it to nothing to compare it to. Yeah. So yeah, I'm dealing with some prolapse. So I'm primarily going to um, pelvic floor PT for my prolapse. And also like my pubic bone is still giving me problems. It's not nearly as bad. I can walk, but still overextending it, overexerting it, you know, I still get kind of sore. So, but the prolapse is the big thing at this point that I'm, you know, trying to get under control. So, you know, you're back at bar slowly. I am am back at bar. Yep. And honestly, like, I know I talked about it pregnancy, but it's such an incredible thing postpartum as well, because so many of the movements are engaging your pelvic floor and engaging your core muscles. And those are the things that you need to build back up after, you know, having a baby and being pregnant. So once again, it's been such a huge blessing in my recovery process that I'm just so lucky that I have. Yeah. I'm grateful for sure. There are so many lessons in this podcast as we wrap it up here. (laughs) Yes. I think one is listening to your body. What other advice do you have for our listeners? Grace, being so graceful with yourself and just trying so hard to deeply love yourself through it. I had this really intense moment that I'll share that's pretty like vulnerable, but it was kind of like a little bit of a breakthrough with me. So I didn't really realize how much I had abandoned myself during my healing process. I was kind of like in victim mode a little bit and just feeling like I didn't understand, you know, why all these things kept happening. And I was just in kind of a dark space and not connected to myself. I was impatient. I was just like not feeling good. And so I took a bath one day. And I was doing this kind of, this loving kindness meditation and the beginning of it was doing a body scan and just like feeling deeply into your body. And I just started bawling in the bathtub and I didn't really realize at first where the tears were coming from. And then I realized it's because I like have not even paid attention to my body like that in so long, like to even feel in my body, to feel where tension was. And it was just such an emotional moment. And I just like hugged myself in the bath. And just, I just felt so sad <laughs> at how I had been treating my body and myself. And so that's you're kind caring of, for your sons. And- yeah. Like I felt like I, I had this like big dream of having this like unmedicated vaginal birth and then I did it. And that was like, that was it. I didn't yeah. think about it anymore after that. And I didn't really like, I didn't celebrate that success. Yeah, your body you know? did it. You beat the odds. And yeah, like I just was like, okay, well on to the next thing. Now we're going to heal. Now we have this long process. And I, I didn't give her credit for all she had done and all she was still doing. And I just think deeply loving yourself through the healing process and loving your body, you know, loving the fact that your body is making milk and still, you know, feeding your child and giving life to your child and healing itself and all of the things it's like simultaneously doing. I just wish I would have had that realization sooner because I just wonder if my, if my process would have been different, if I would have been more in tune and more in love with myself through it. And it's also hard just, when you're in the thick of it. So yeah, to really yeah. see the light. Yeah. I'm so um, glad that you did. Me too. <laughs> it took a little bit, but you know, I always end up coming around at some point with some crazy lessons along the way, but yeah, yeah I just think my advice is put as much thought into your healing process and postpartum and the support that you need as you do into your birth that you want, because it is a bigger journey than birth is. And then pregnancy is, is, at least it was for me. And I just wish I would have put more thought into that and like just what I, what I needed and what I, I don't know. I, I went into it really a little bit blindly and was blindsided because of that. So Beautiful. Yes, I agree. And we talk a lot about that in the Becoming course, about Mm -hmm. how postpartum is as important. So thanks for sharing your story, Amber. We need to talk about our stories more. So I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much, Kristen. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Ask the Doulas. For more information about Gold Coast Doulas, visit us on our website, goldcoastdoulas.com. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and give us a five-star review. Thank you. Remember, these moments are golden.